So I don't know why, but for several years now, I've been very interested in learning about the human brain. And today I'm going to show you some of the things that I found. First off, I found some good news and some bad news. But to be kind, everybody, let's start with the good news first. The good news is you have a beautiful brain. Now, I say it's beautiful, not because it looks good, it doesn't, it's kind of ugly. But for the work that this three pounds of fatty tissue seems to be capable of, this brain, with its 84 billion neurons, has somehow been able to create timeless works of art, music, literature, that the world has never seen before. And now we all, we all have brains, of course, but you may not know that they're all the same, basically, even Einstein's. And the, um, the, the potential of that is that it, it blows away every scientist who tries to study it because it's so complex. In fact, Experts have modeled that. Experts have modeled that and have said that to assimilate a brain like this, your brain, it would take a supercomputer the size of a city block. It would take a dedicated hydro dam to power it and a diverted river to cool it. Impressive, to say the least. I mean, especially when you think that all that potential fits into your, comfortably into your cranium, and you walk around with it every day. But with all this wonder and beauty and mystery, there's one thing your brain can't do. It can't feel anything. Nothing. Zero. Nada. Zilch. Your brain has no pain receptors. So what's a surgeon actually gains access to it directly, he could literally pluck out the piano lessons or how, ap how Aunt Bessie's apple pie tasted and you, wouldn't be, you could be fully awake the whole time and you wouldn't feel anything. So, remember that because I'll come back to that later. So, now the bad news. The bad news is you have a brain in your gut. And it's, but it's got a redeeming factor. It actually can, can act as a calming factor. I call it, it actually has a, as an agent, as a bombing agent. It can be used as a bombing agent, which really means B-A-L-M is spent, is, it means a comforting, soothing, or restorative effect. So in fact, if you have a brain that's very, a head brain very overworried, the gut brain can be applied to that. I'll talk about that in a minute here. So I'm going to show you, I'll cut to the chase here and show you this actual brain, this gut brain, and uh, I'm going to explain three ways that this other brain saves you. Oh, and there's more bad news. This brain is really ugly. It's actually quite small, but the size of a cat's brain. Uh, and you probably haven't heard much about it. it hasn't been, it's kind of a scientific finding. And uh, it has in it about 100 million neurons apparently very gooey ones. And, uh, but it, it's actually can act on its own, it does and, and can act on its own, apart from instructions from this guy over here. It's only loosely connected to the head brain by a series of nerves called the vagus nerve, which has about 2,000 nerve fibers in it, which 
As fibers go in the nerve section, it's not very much. And uh, And this, this brain is, uh, so it, the, the, what the main function of this brain is, is to look after digestion of foodstuffs and to strip out the nutrients and then the waste is then forced out of the body. It's actually located, really, even though these, these, these neurons are, are very hard to find, some of them can be three feet long, but it's still really hard to find some, find it because there was, it's, it's embedded and hidden in layers of tissue that line the esophagus, the stomach wall, the intestines, and the colon. So it does, it's not only ugly, it does a really smelly job. A job that the head brain would rather not get its hands dirty with. And uh, let me just, oh, let's do this here. Blank. There we are. So, so, I should mention two things. Humans do two main things all day, every day for our entire lives. We think things and we feel things. And that got me thinking that you know, I was thinking about my own gut, you know, the leadings and the promptings that maybe you have, you know, gut feelings, right? But apparently, I wasn't alone in thinking about those things. Many people, successful people, have used this phenomena for years. Richard Branson, for instance, says, I never get accounts in before I start a business. It's done on gut feeling. When asked about her success, Sarah Blakely, the founder of Spanx, said, I had a passion for my product, and I trusted my gut. Now, I didn't just make up this brain in an action of crazy creativity. In fact, you'll soon see that truth is stranger than fiction. In 1996, I became aware of an article from the science section of the New York Times. In it, it boldly reported that a very prominent and well-known scientist, uh, cell biologist in New York City, had declared that he had rediscovered a truth that another brain existed in the human body. In fact, he wrote a book about it called The Second Brain. And that, uh, to me, was like the sky opened up and, and, the, and, and, and the pieces fell into place because of the puzzle I was trying to put together needed that one little bit of information. The idea that there are two brains, one that thinks but can't feel, one that feels but can't think. Is that not the most elegant, simple, and efficient system you could ever think of for a human that has a body and a, and a mind? Apparently, 260 years ago, others have thought about that too. Baron de Menescu, he said this way, a really intelligent man feels what other men only know. Of course, he had no awareness that a second brain existed, so he had to sort of work with it. And 200 years ago, the uh, philosopher Oppenhauer, he said, there is something in us wiser than our head. So he had an inkling that this dual brain function also related to intelligence. Obviously, this is not a thinking brain. This is a feeling brain. And it feels everything, from our deepest sorrows to our greatest joys and everything in between including reaching into the ethereal depths of our potentiality and giving us promptings for what we should be doing. Now, that's one way that the, 
that brain saves us. Let's look at a couple more. It's true that the head brain thinking can go, has a dark side to it. It can go sideways. And this was noticed early on by experts, and they started to do something about it. The American Psychiatric Association began putting together and cataloging various human psychological maladies. Their latest edition, called the DSM-5, is 147 pages long and contains 300 different disorders. The a second here. And uh, obviously, to to deal with that, um, is a is a, is an endless cycle because really what we're talking about here is to try and get the head brain to fix itself, which is kind of a falls on its face a bit because that's where all the crappy problems are. So anyway, the other the other aspect of that is self-help. Self-help showed up about 100 years ago. It gave us hope that perhaps we could fix ourselves. But there's a problem because it hasn't much changed in all that time. It pretty much its message is pretty much the same because it aims it at the head brain, which as I said, that's where all the problems are. It doesn't actually address the fact that there's another brain, because maybe it didn't know it. However, so it has a, a slight flaw there. It has ballooned to be a $10 billion per year industry in the United States alone. So I kind of like think they'd like to keep that going. So to look at a brain in the gut that a person can optimize once and get an ongoing stress effect on the, in live time would probably be counterproductive to their business. I sort of wonder if I should join the witness protection program. <laughs> so I guess in that when I mentioned that $10 billion per year, a lot of that is repeat business. In fact, it's known that many people who buy a cell phone book will buy one seven months later. So I guess it's a bit like having potato chips. You can't just have one. Now, I've started writing a book. I've not, it's, not, it's in progress. However, I don't have any fancy research to point to. I just... Uh, I just work with people, and uh, the results I have are anecdotal, I admit. And, uh, and the idea of having another brain that can help cure overworry or have an effect on ongoing stress is an awful well idea from an unlikely source. But let's remember, experts built the Titanic, and a couple of bicycle repairmen introduced us to the age of flight. Now, I believe this whole thing is really there's a disconnect here, a disconnect between what we see as our mindset and what we now know about our dual brain set. And that's where I'm in that category, trying to educate the world of something that they don't know anything about. But, and I know it's, I know it's the most commonly used uh, cure or commonly use application to try and, and, and kill a negative thought, but to, to try and blow out negative thought by shooting positive thought on top is a bit like controlling a flood with a fire hose. I think that many people could be benefited if they knew how to optimize both brains together and create a natural buffering effect as the stress occurs. And now, let's talk about the last way, my favorite way, that this brain saves you. I guess one there. Okay. You know, you've heard it from your parents, your teachers, your peers, your employers. 
But I like the way Og Magdito said it. For now you know one of the greatest principles of success. If you persist long enough, you will win. And certainly, artist, Canadian artist, David Usher says, persistence turns everything into progress. Now, I use the word persistence quite a bit in my work. So I got to thinking, what the heck is it? What is persistence? People ask me, you know, what, what exactly is it? Well, I turned to the dictionary, but it didn't offer much insight. I turned to, uh, I, I learned that every, every, every country in the world, almost, has their, a word for it. And uh, people have written about it. Uh, for instance, Napoleon Hill, in his book, Think Grow Rich, he talked about it about uh, almost 100 times. He saw it as, uh, it as character of man to, like, like carbon as to steel. Well, that's a nice, not bad, but it's a bit servicey yet. He never actually nailed it and gave us the actual print way of, of, of how to contact, what, how to connect with it. If, if it were thought-based, if we could dream it up, we could teach it, like math or language. And every child could grow up to be pay persistence in love and kindness and generosity, be an ideal world to live in. Persistence is only felt by the gut brain. It doesn't, isn't exactly, it doesn't produce it, it feels it. And, and it feels it just enough to, to signal the head brain to give it one more try. And, one time, and usually that last push is what creates a positive outcome. So if you've ever had that yourself, congratulations. You've been saved by a brain you probably didn't even know you had. So the takeaway is this. Because the head brain gets into overworry, the head brain suffers. But the unthinking gut brain buffers. It's hard to stop overthinking. So the head brain can enslave us. But the unthinking gut brain saves us. Thank you.